And so uh, back in May, we put forward a an initial first pass of what we we thought a heat network for Glasgow might look at look like, which we're going to sort of summarise uh, in a moment. Um, Kurt, we'll, we'll we'll talk through the methodology that we used Comsoft, and so I should mention that that our thoughts and inspirations were then. Uh, coalesced when we found the Comsoft Heat software, which is this, we think, brilliant sort of software platform that allows us to visualize and create scenarios and build up narratives around what can make a heat network work. Um, and that's what we've been using um, to, to, to put together this, this, little, this little scenario. So um, without further ado, I shall introduce the, the members of the of the Heat Vision 2030 project, um, Comsoft Heat. That's a software that designs um, uh, heat networks, star renewable energy, headed up by uh, Dave Pearson, um, that is, specializes in river source heat pumps. Um, and we that is the heat generating source we've selected uh, par excellence for this heat network. IES are a global leader in building performance analysis. Here at MiniBEMS, we use our enterprise Internet of Things platform to manage and optimize heat networks in real time. And also Vital Energy, um, who um, most of you certainly in the UK will, will be familiar with, but they're a, a leading firm when it comes to actually digging up the roads and putting the pipe works, the pipes in the ground so that they're, they're a big player in terms of build and operation of heat networks in the UK. So, these are the different uh, companies that have taken out their little magic dust and sprinkled it on the um, on the uh, on the software to sort of build up this narrative. Um, and the, you, you will we'll spend me, you know, a, a little the, the first part of the webinar putting, you know, explaining to you. A lot of people today have not were not at the last uh, webinar, so it's an opportunity to bring them up to speed and remind. Uh, also, those of you who were there back in May, a little bit how we do things. But uh, a big part of what we like to do is to get questions and get your ideas in. Uh, we don't believe that what we've put together is the blueprint, but it's a starting point for discussion. So, um, and it's a discussion based on, you know, what we what we dare to believe can make a heat network happen. A heat network invest investable um, is essentially. Um, Based on the same things that any you know endeavor is is based on, which is how can we make it low risk? How can we make it predictable such that investors will come to the table? How can we repeat it so that it's something that you can scale up? And uh, how can we demonstrate, or can we demonstrate that there's a suitable return on investment? So that was our sort of starting point in terms of how can well, what does this look like? What does this kind of scenario look like? And what we found, uh, and what we're going to discuss today, are the um, the barriers, uh, and, and, and of which there are plenty, um, one of which is um, the idea of offtake surety. So, for every pipe that goes into the the street, uh, ensuring that every building next to that bit of pipe will actually take the heat. Um, not having offtake surety can create big problems for the viability of a heat network. Uh, An electricity price, uh, particularly if you're going with heat pumps, which many heat networks will do. Um, an electricity price is key. Um, is it locally generated? What sort of price can you achieve? Because that is what's going to be driving um, the heat pumps to generate the heat. Then there's a sort of um, there's a behavioural aspect here. We're so used to gas being the um, the corollary of of heat. Uh, what are you paying for your gas? That's how we perceive um, heat in so many cases, both domestically, commercially, at industrial level as well. And the gas price is low. Uh, and if we plan to replace it with something else, the economic, simple economics would dictate that it's going to drop even lower. So how do we how do we deal with that issue of low and very low gas prices versus the price of heat, which um, inevitably, well, not inevitably, but it seems to be very likely that it will always be higher and perhaps quite substantially so. And the next two pieces are about you know public engagement, bringing the community and the local the local local citizenship with you you know how many people know about district heat networks how many people are asking their politicians to get involved um, how many people think heat networks are the best thing since sliced bread uh, these are all uh, questions I think that per perhaps uh, as a group of companies this is not our 
main skill set, but something that we realize that we that needs to be addressed as well. And then that, if that's the grassroots piece, you've got stakeholder buying, which is um, essentially you know a lot of the people that are here today. And so thanks very much for coming along because it's 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 those who have the power to develop strategy who can bring uh, technology to the table uh, and collaborate to to make these things realistic. Uh, as well as bringing realistic and um, you know, important points of view. Unless we're all working together, then it's going to be complicated as well. Um, <clears throat> not least, uh, the regulatory mix, of course, uh, the political elements here, governments, the Scottish government have got a heat networks bill um, in development. Um, you know, uh, there's been a lot of debate about that. Um, uh, and I think you know, it, it probably still needs a lot more work to make it to make it happen. But what is that regulatory mix that will deliver heat networks um, in a serious fashion? And then finally, the amount of data that is available uh, and two, two, two big pieces of data that uh, need to be um, brought to brought to the table and understood a lot more on one hand is what does current demand look like? What is the demand of the buildings that exist as they are today? Um, but also what does future demand look like both you know once you've taken on energy efficiency and once you have um seen how the use might change over time as well um you know many city centers may find themselves um a lot more uh with a lot more residential a bigger residential component over the next few decades um and then on what's under the ground all these certainly glasgow and many other cities are hundreds of years old um and no one uh, really understands what's under the ground which makes it highly highly complicated and therefore expensive to to get this uh, stuff done properly okay so that is sort of where we are now and then what i'd like to do now is pass over uh to kurt um if you can share your video kurt and um uh We'll, we'll let you uh, take the stand. Just to remind everyone who's here, uh, what the, you know, what we do, how the Comsoft heat technology works. That's the basis for our our presentation today. You seem to be on mute, Kurt. Okay, now it should work. Perfect. Okay. Okay, thanks, Ben. Please uh, move on to the next slide. So, indeed, we are going to use uh, Comsoft Heat. So, that is an, uh, a tool that we have developed over the past few years. It's a tool for um, automated planning and design of uh, district heating networks, and it's offering high level of automation. Besides the technical design, um, all the necessary financial information to complete the feasibility study or to get inputs for a business plan will be part of the outputs, as you will see. So please go on to the next slide to show the methodology. So what is the starting point? Um, we need the, um, the details of the district where the network will be planned. So we need the GIS data of the, the streets, know where the, uh, the buildings are located. So based on building polygons, we need um, heat demand, very important uh, to get an idea of the, the heat demand and kilowatt for every building in the area. Um, we have to provide the technical parameters uh, that are required to design a network, such as uh, pressure settings, temperature settings of the network, and cost parameters. Cost parameters to indicate what the network costs will be and price per meter for different pipe types, uh, prices for substations, and prices for uh, heat exchangers. Um, so please proceed, Ben, with a few ticks. Okay, so this is the GUI how to enter the details. And when you click next, you will see how a um, possible result could look like. So what we see on the right side is an um, automatically generated uh, network uh, with buildings clustered, grouped together in um, distribution networks and then uh, transport networks are interconnecting the, the substations at a higher level. Additionally, you get outputs such as the network deployment costs and a bill of material with all details. So on the next slide, we see some more details. So the bill of material gives you an, uh, an overview of all the required uh, pipe types, the trenching length 
and the cost per meter for each of the pipes that you are using in the network. Um, also breakdown in the price of the transport network, the price of the distribution pipe, the price of the service connection pipes, and then the costs for the um, heat exchangers in the buildings at the end. Also the costs for um, the heat sources are taken into account here. All this data that uh, we are using is coming from the different partners in this uh, project. So of course, a uh, district heating network is not rolled out in a year. You need to count for several years to be able to finalize it, at least when it is getting a certain size, you need several years to work it out. So with the software, you can also plan the rollout over multiple years. And um, you can um, do an investment analysis on your project. So you, you assume that the lifetime of a project will be uh, 50 to 60 years. So we can calculate for the project uh, also automatically uh, by giving in the, the correct um, parameters. We can calculate the net present value and turn the rate of return and payback time. So for these um, uh, calculations, we need the, uh, the phased cost of the rollout. Uh, we need the heat production costs in um, megawatt hours A for each of the uh, heat produced. Network maintenance is taken into consideration, as well as the sales of heat to end customers is taken into consideration to come up with those uh, financial indicators. Next, please, Ben. Yeah, there we have it. And then on the next slide, um, what we're going to use in this case um, for heat demand data or energy consumption data for Glasgow is the uh, information that we got from hotmaps. HotMaps is an online database uh, providing heat density data up to 100 meters squared for almost all European cities. Um, so if you click uh, next band a few times, you will see how we capture this in our software. So we can um, select the area in um, yeah, the online system. We map it onto the district under consideration in our Comsoft heat tool. And in this way, we can then calculate um, or, let's say, design the network based on the heat demand that is um, being taken from the hot maps data. So that's a very good estimate as a starting point. It saves you time. Of course, in a later stage, you need to go into more detail to look into uh, more accuracy um, of what is actually the um, heat consumption at every individual building. But that would be too time consuming to do in this uh, stage of the project. Uh, next, please. Yes. So once we have created our first scenario, we can easily go back to uh, stages at the input phase, make changes to the parameters, cost parameters, technical parameters, and calculate new scenarios for comparison. So that is what we have done as well now. In this case for Glasgow, you will see we have uh, generated, calculated multiple scenarios, and step by step, we are converging to a scenario that uh, who knows in the end could be realized. So um, yeah, Ben, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt. Uh, brilliant. So there you are. That's um, a little bit about how it all works. Um, I can see some questions coming in. This is all good. So please do. Um, I'll be collecting questions and fielding them to the, the panel um, once we've sort of finished our presentation. So please do crack on with those coming through. Yeah, so once again, that's a reminder of where we, you know, where, where we ended up uh, with our sort of first, first scenario. Um, and it was basically this, um, it was driven by this idea of, we've got 10 years to deliver a zero carbon or a low carbon heat network for Glasgow city centre. So 100% coverage and 100% um, uh, uptake. So pretty ambitious i think we could probably agree but we thought heck may as well start somewhere and we ended up with this um this sort of four four district piece um, uh, um supplied by four um heat pumps uh drawing their heat from the river clyde uh of del delivering around 10 megawatts each and um what we find is you know we were uh, the big benefits were and remain um carbon emissions being reduced massively against gas, um, clean air, no, 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 no air emissions, and energy resilience. Um, so I'll just 
once again, just to go through a little bit of the, the imagery here, this is the, the, the area that we looked at. It was delineated by this, um, this blue line here. The stars represent where the heat pumps are. And one of the big things, uh, decisions you have to make is the flow and return temperature. In this case, it was 80 flow and a return temperature of 10 degrees. Then, um, yeah, we, we punched all that information um, into the, the Comsoft software. We, we, we gave the software um, instructions uh, as to what pipe, what, 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 um, what route it should take, uh, as well as using our own local knowledge, trying to figure out what would make sense uh, given, given Glasgow city centre. Um, and this is what it came up with. And then, um, yeah, so this is the sort of visual representation of the four districts that we were mapping and designing to. Um, and then we came up with our bill of materials and the assumptions that we that we looked at in this first instance um, you'll see on the right hand side here we had a price per meter of pipe put in the ground so the trench work the labor the materials of pipe work per uh, based on the diameter of the pipe work so everything from uh, is it dn32 up to, to dn6 600 there so dn25 and then on this left hand side in the bottom, you can see we had um, the, the estimations of what the cost would be to fit a heat delivery unit, heat interface unit, to integrate the heat within each building. Um, and we um, we applied it based on the size of the heat load within each building. So one to 50 is uh, your apartments, 50 to 100, a larger building, et cetera, et cetera. And these are our estimation of the cost we said for each one. Um, and then it was just over half a million per megawatt of heat pump installed um, on these barges uh, by the by the banks of the River Clyde, or on the banks of the River Clyde. So, um, and that this is basically what we what we ended up with. We ended up with a heat network that we would cost about 100 million pounds, um, and would deliver about 47, 50 odd kilometers worth of pipe work. And then you can see that we had sort of three principal cost factors. The distribution is related to the pipe work in the ground. Um, the service connection is taking it from the street into the building. And then the, the demand relates to the, the heat interface units, the actual connecting uh, the, the heat into the secondary side. So heating up those radiators, et cetera. So that's where we were, that's where we left you all um, back in May. Um, we have since spent a fair amount of time thinking and talking, and I'm going to pass over to uh, Dave now to sort of go through what, what we've come up with since then. Okay, okay thanks, Ben. So very much in the, in the style uh, of standing on the shoulders of giants, it's all about what's gone before and how much we've learned from that. And it's it's really quite apparent that this is a is a huge undertaking, um, and and really when on the previous slide you would have seen uh, approximately eighty five percent of the first pass was the core network, um, whether there are buildings connected to that or not. So so simple logic says it's it's about getting as many uh, kilowatt hours sold per meter of pipe as possible. So quite clearly, if this is a highly optional, somewhat um, Un, unregulated, un, undriven market, the uptake is going to be at the lower end. And uh, what we need to find is, is the way of getting the maximal offtake surety. And that's essentially also uh, the flip side of any investment. Nobody in the right mind, whether it's government or private enterprise, is going to say, yep, yeah, let's put 100 million into the streets of Glasgow because we think, and it might be nice if people uh, bought heat from this. There's got to be this offtake surety, otherwise the, the payback's not going to be there. So the other thing that we did was, and we, you know, always, always said this is not a perfect model. It's evolving all the time. We went, we went uh, through a process of asking, what do you think of this? And and the feedback came, well, you know, the costings could be a little bit better. Um, you know, maybe you've missed out some aspects. Um, maybe you should probably create a business model from it as well. And you know there is some really good stuff going on in Glasgow already. Uh, your our city uh, centre project is is really mapping out some of the the avenues of of streets that will be upgraded. Anybody that knows Glasgow will have seen the transformation in Suckley Hall Street, um, principally around um, you know, the the lifestyle 
and, and people living there and access and uh, non non motorized transport being a key part of it. And clearly, if you're going to dig up the streets, you want to try and do it in a coordinated fashion. That's just common sense. It's not the way it happens, but it's common sense. And then there's a, another project uh, kicking off in Glasgow about a, a carbon neutral innovation district, which is principally, if you remember our four four bands of, of areas, the right hand one over at the right that stretches from uh, Strathclyde University in, in the north down to um, through the, um, the Merchant City. And, and to the Clyde. So we, we listened to them as well and some of their feedback. So next slide, please, Ben. So matching that up and we, we modelled it and quite clearly when you model something, you get some feedback and uh, what was quite apparent was even at 100% uptake, uh, this is going to be difficult. We're moving into a period where uh, the, the UK having had the most progressive uh, support mechanisms to to deliver the uh, European Union's uh, renewable heat uh, plan. And um, that's coming to an end of a period that's lasted uh, in theory from 2008, but in reality, uh, there was no um, subsidy surety uh, for large uh, district heating projects using, using heat pumps until pretty much uh, the summer of 2018. So, uh, around about two years ago, we started seeing the mechanism that the funders would want, which is basically uh, rather than saying, if I turn up and deliver this whole programme and then apply for RHI, um, I might get it or I might not, to saying at the beginning of the project, look, I want I want a, a, a guarantee of the, the subsidy. Um, so we've really only had this support mechanism for two years. Uh, these projects take at least uh, five years. The Queen's Key project we were involved in dates back five years. Uh, other projects we've been involved in date back uh, similar periods of time. So quite clearly, we've not allowed the mechanism to run long enough. Um, so we're coming to the end of that, and that has to be factored into the modelling to see where we're at. Uh, there's then a question of where the funding comes from and what level of um, cost that will be. And then as you break it down, and uh, how many uh, buildings there are, uh, whether it's domestic apartment blocks or commercial, in, the, in that fairly tight centre of Glasgow, it's, it's 1,300 buildings. That's quite clearly a lot of different connections. And so some of the advice we got from uh, Vital Energy was about uh, routings and how best to do that. And some ideas we had, they said, that's not a very good idea. Why don't you do it like this? Let's think about doing this. Think about the other aspects about um, uh, distant heating networks. We originally had said, let's leave the gas boilers in place originally. And the advice was, well, if you're offering somebody their only supply of heat and they can take away their infrastructure inside their building, they'll be prepared to pay more. So that's a much better place to be. And then quite clearly, the, the obvious one of anybody that's in the, the power market at the moment is seeing that we're seeing a, a decreasingly small amount of the cost of electricity being the, the generating cost and an increasingly large amount being being the on cost. And it's uh, quite, quite dramatic. So where a, a facility can uh, take private wire connection, for example, uh, the cost of electricity is half. So what private wire uh, opportunities are there in the centre of a big city? Well, it's pretty limited, but uh, that doesn't mean that we, we, we stop looking for it. It does beg the question if that is a somewhat artificial uh, piece uh, that's averaged out over the whole country, then perhaps if the government want to deliver these schemes, they maybe need to do some sort of um, Ultra sleeving arrangement on a PPA where that there is a private wire, but it's it's not direct private wire. It's extended private wire, but it's sleeved, and the, and the grid costs are, are are not quite as dramatic as they are on, on on normal grid. So next slide, please, Ben. So again, back through the the uh, the piece with the costs, uh, drilled all that down, um, added in energy centre costs, added in power connection costs added in an observation that we might need intermediate pumps. Glasgow is, is somewhat hilly as you go from the river up to the top. Um, any former student of Strathclyde will know that, that uh, some of the streets are a little bit uh, off-putting. I'll just say that. Um, and we drilled through all of that, uh, you know, perhaps needing intermediate pumps, and came out the, the uh, went backwards, actually, in terms of the, the material cost and district heating uh, pipe costs, just took a, a, a simpler way of looking at it. And uh, that gave us a, a new running total. Next slide, please, Ben. And also the new district, uh, the observant of you will notice that the, particularly the right-hand 
area has extended further north. We'd stopped pretty much at Sucky Oak Street uh, and have extended now up over Gilmore Hill and um, up to the motorway because that's the region that the, uh, the your city was looking at and hence a uh, greater level of um, uh, pipe work. So we're now up at 74 kilometres, greater level of heat demand, uh, greater level of heat sales though and, and then started thinking around these questions around uh, private wire, what is there nearby? Paul Medi is selling electricity to the grid for four and a half uh, pence approximately, if it's on a, on a typical rate. What if there was a private wire from, from Paul Medi down, down to this? What if you ran the cable for that uh, down the river to try and cut some of the costs of, of digging up uh, some of the streets? So lots of what ifs. That, that So we've been asking questions. I know there's a lot of questions coming through, but we've been asking our own questions. How can we make this better? So next slide, please. And we got, not surprisingly, having done all that, we got a much higher uh, total cost to the project. We also split it out. Uh, you'll notice distribution is is now split. Uh, energy centre cost is uh, set out at 34% of the total, uh, distribution 43%, and service connections at 17 and demand at 6. So we've really been evolving these costs as we go. Um, one thing that's really important to say is it's what we're observing in the gaps. Um, there is no actual uh, gas cost data or, he or heat load data in this. It's all from, from uh, GIS data. And that's uh, early observation for me is who has got all the gas billing data for the buildings in this area? Why can't that be uh, made publicly available for these, these sort of projects? So, uh, and, and what's under the ground was a major feedback from, from Vital Energy's work, particularly round about Strathclyde University. Uh, where the, even, even ground penetrating radar wasn't really showing services being alive or dead, uh, what's down there, how, how deep down do you have to go, what level of cover under the road do you need. So a really, really big project. So aspirationally, brilliant, uh, but but be ready to, to be thinking in terms of um, 250 million for, for this sort of area. So next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So, output. This is this is the the challenge. So, two parts to this uh, slide. Uh, top left hand corner, you see thirty three pounds per megawatt hour. That is the cost of producing heat from a heat pump. That is a an efficiency of around about three. So, uh, take that as uh, ten uh, pence uh, per kilowatt hour, or a hundred pounds per megawatt hour for the electricity, uh, and therefore the cost of heat is thirty three. That's obviously quite high. Gas is notionally around about two pence. We then below that got another uh, in the sort of uh, salmon coloured uh, saying, well, what if it was private wire at 45 pounds per megawatt hour? What does that do to the, the viability of this project? How important is it to be able to get this? And bear in mind, this is still based on 100% uptake. So quite clearly, there's going to have to be some sort of legislation. Otherwise, frankly, if you've got 50% as much heat sold, your numbers are even worse than these, and these don't these don't look particularly good as uh, one of the outcomes. There's then uh, the, the you see four numbers uh, ranging from 12, 10, 8, and 6. That's the selling price of heat to the consumers, and quite clearly that is a significant way above uh, the, the price of gas at the moment. So gas is round about two pence. To put some context on the the value of the renewable heat incentive, that is round about six pence uh, support mechanism. But it's finishing. That's the key point. It's it's uh, set a, a time scale that was to end in 2021. We're approaching that, and it's and it's finishing. So the key observation for this is, if there is not an ongoing uh, operational support mechanism, then you need to have the arm well up the backs of the the heat consumers, so that they basically have to uh, take heat at somewhere between six and 12 pence, and all of them doing that. So you have on one end of the seesaw, really, really strong, powerful legislation, and the other end, no support mechanism, or some sort of support mechanism to, to um, frankly, dilute the costs, um, and then maybe you could have a, a lower price of heat. So where the RHI to continue, for example, uh, then you could, at, even if it was a lesser rate of, say, four pence per kilowatt hour, then you could, uh, have cost parity for the end users at six pence 
because there's a 4P uh, support mechanism for them. So that's the sort of level of input. Uh, we modelled it on an IRR um, ranging, and, and the way the model works is the, the discount factor that's an input is set at four pence. If your IRR is higher than that discount factor, then that's effectively uh, giving you a positive NPV for the scheme. So at the moment, we're still seeing uh, legislation or, or direction coming from Bayes is that there will be some form of uh, uh, green heat network uh, support. Basically, from what we can pick up a little bit like the, the heat network um, partnerships, um, where it's a capital grant. But uh, bear in mind, our, our total cost was 250 million. Uh, HNIP is around about 25 percent. So uh, you're really trying to get a, as positive an NPV as possible, or, or certainly a, as limited negative. So financially, massively challenging. However, if you move across to the large yellow boxes, the natural gas carbon footprint from this scheme per annum is 31,500 tonnes of CO2 from burning gas in the city centre every year. And take that over 40 years, 60 years, whatever lifetime you want, 30 years if we're aiming for 2050, uh, 25 years if it's uh, you know the Scottish targets, it's a huge carbon footprint from that. And on the right hand side, the yellow box is the, the uh, grid intensity at the moment, but we know that's falling. Arguably, it's uh, it's fat end of zero in, in Scotland because there's uh, a net um, excess of uh, renewable uh, production. Um, so when you balance that up, an interesting calculation that we did was how much does that cost per ton of carbon uh, to uh, balance off this negative NPV? So let's assume private wire, 15 uh, pounds per megawatt hour. Let's assume we somehow or other can get people to, to buy heat at six pounds, which is a stretch, I admit. And we've got this negative NPV of 134 million over the life of the project. Um, how much does that cost per tonne? And it was around about £140 per tonne uh, for the carbon. So quite uh, in-depth analysis at the end point. And this is the, the whole piece around this is it's lots and lots of work drilling down to uh, outcomes. What we've not got, uh, incidentally, here is any connection fee. Uh, but we know that in the Netherlands, for example, there's an initial €5,000 connection fee, which effectively is the uh, one of the compensations for, for um, joining district heating uh, is that you you get get rid of your existing infrastructure and your maintenance costs over the next 20 years, your asset replacement costs, et cetera, et cetera. So just saying gas is 2P is, is really overly simplistic. You've got to sort of persuade the, the customer base that there's a much more rounded uh, set of costs coming their way over the piece. And frankly, uh, uh, wise them up to uh, air quality aspects and, and all that other stuff. So next slide, please. So conclusions, um, it's it's going to be pretty tricky. Uh, I said already, we're going to have to find uh, the lowest possible price of electricity. It makes a massive difference to the the valuation. Um, but there's there's some significant big wins. You know, um, huge carbon savings from this energy resilience, air quality, job creation aspect. That's uh, quite clearly the the topic of the of the moment. Um, but with some challenges, some of these bear directly to the costs. But, you know, what are the future heat loads? Glasgow's uh, regenerating. There's going to be more people living in the city and, and less offices. Um, some of the shops might change to, to apartments. Um, big unknowns. How do we uh, turn big unknowns into the minimal possible cost? And that probably, in my mind, means don't wait for the, the supply chain to go out and do uh, you know investigative um, ground penetration radar. Do it as a city now. Get ahead of the game. Um, start thinking about the, the price of electricity and how we're going to do that locally. What other op options are there? Is there is there better sources of heat than the the River Clyde? You know, Paul Bedee is there. It's a, it's got um, no heat offtake at the moment, uh, but it's it's not necessarily the right place. One one of the schemes we looked at in in Serbia uh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, one of the one of the concepts was piping the waste heat at low grade, because if you take higher grade heat, you get less electricity, which is their business model. So rather than uh, playing around with the, the Z factor, uh, we could uh, pipe uh, waste heat at, say, 40 degrees uh, down to the heat pumps uh, in a pipe in the river that's insulated, obviously, uh, but it'd be an easy route. 
and therefore perhaps get a better efficiency from the heat pumps and therefore use less electricity. So lots of lots of levers and buttons we can push. But uh, fundamentally, what this comes down to is there's uh, huge challenges in this project. Um, you know, we're we're here to sort of uh, shine a light on how difficult this is going to be. Not stand up and say this is dead easy. Let's just go and do it. Um, without strong legislation, strong leadership, strong support mechanisms, this is not going to happen. So we better be getting ready because district heating is being touted as the way to 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 solve uh, the challenges. It's available now, uh, technically, uh, but commercially, quite clearly, there's a big hurdle to overcome. Um, and frankly, also. People just don't know what district heating is, so uh, we've got to um, get this uh, messaging started now. Of if you do district heating, then you will have less air pollution in the centre of your city, and and that's one of the the things that people have um, uh, jumped on over the, the the sort of lockdown period. Is air quality is much better. So next slide, please. And that's it. So questions. Uh, Ben's going to be uh, marshalling these, but um, as I said, and others have said. This is very much about what do you think? Do you think this is a, a, a pile of rubbish? In which case, tell us why. Do you think that we've maybe missed the trick and could make it easier? Tell us why. How do we go forwards? Back to my comment about it standing on the shoulders of giants. Let's make it better next time round because we're not finished. But I think what we have shown is that this team, uh, and you know, it should be pointed out, nobody has paid for this work. This is something we've all volunteered as passionate about the, the industry passionate about the, the challenge have, have uh, volunteered, principally to show the methodology, the, the blueprint. So tell us how we can do it better. Thank you so much, Dave. Jolly good. Well, the, the questions are coming. I'm going to try and uh, put maybe some of the questions related to the modelling process itself first, uh, and then there's sort of other, other aspects as well. Um, so <clears throat> I'll, I'll maybe group a couple of them together. Um, Paul Steen just says, um, have we tried the, the national heat map in Scotland, which provides individual heat demands per building? Uh, I'm not sure if, if, if we have actually, uh, and whether we found I'll, that. I'll answer that one because we, we, we did look at that. Uh, yeah. Kurt has access to that data and uh, the hot maps stuff is principally the, the, the same data as far as I understood from. So essentially what we've done is uh, take that level of granularity from, from the buildings. I think the, the reality is some of it's okay and some of it's uh, less than okay. Um, why not uh, step off now and do a programme of compare and contrast? You know, somebody has got the gas billing data for each of these buildings. Why can't we? Why can't somebody compare that to the, the GIS uh, data? Because it's it's not. There's a, there's several layers of proxy that are are involved through the heat map. I'm a massive fan of it, but it's, uh, it's a wee bit of um, uh, calibration is probably the nicest way of putting it. It's an interesting yeah. regulatory point on, on gas data, Dave, because really, you know, just generally speaking, beyond this project, if 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 uh, the general public were able to see gas usage across the UK, then you'd have all kinds of innovation occurring um, if people could see where, where gas was being used. But of course, we're not privy to that information as it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even, um, even on a commercial building basis, which most of the buildings we looked at were commercial buildings, nobody mm -hmm. has a central register in Scotland of the billing data. And that to me just seems a little bit um, well. What a good opportunity to fix it. Let me just put it that way. Yeah, and often building owners themselves don't know how much gas they're using. So just, just, just actually forcing the publication of gas usage across, across, like you say, across commercial buildings would be a very interesting ex exercise. Um, yeah. Um, another question. So this is more on the technical side. Paul Steen and uh, Paul, good to have you along. Um, looks like there's a lot of interconnection of the networks and complex opposing pumps. How does Comsof analyse the hydraulics within the pipe network? How do we analyse the hydraulics? Um, yeah, well, that, that's maybe going in quite some detail, but um, yeah, we, let's say that, that's that's a. Uh, a question that, maybe, that's, uh, that's, maybe that's one for uh, to discuss yeah. perhaps offline. Later, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, so listen, we'll pick up pick that up one up with you later, Paul. Um, just a few questions about the sort of the data that's that's come through. Um, Paul Mosley asks a couple of things. 
Um, yeah, the 1,341 buildings are stated as domestic apartment block and commercial. Uh, presumably, there are quite a few public buildings in the areas of interest. What assumptions are made about connecting with them? The public sector should be offering anchor loads and showing leadership. Paul also asks, um, you know, to what extent have um, Glasgow City Council been involved? Um, have, they, have there been discussions about the designations of zones for heat networks? Um, and if so, do, how do they align with the proposed areas? So the, the public buildings are in, in under the banner of commercial and, and it's just the tagline. Um, I, I guess we can drill down. Uh, it's not a report that we've produced of how many were domestic, how many were commercial, but it's in there. Yeah, I mean, if, if uh, a nation has got a challenge and it can't get its own public estate uh, to play its part in solving that challenge, then uh, I, think, I think we need to go and play a different game. Um, so 100% uptake, um, some would say that's uh, crazy in terms of the, 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 the private buildings, um, some would say it's crazy for the public buildings, but it ought not to be, uh, so they have to, it's as simple as that. If we want to do this, you need to get as many people as possible to do it, if not 100%, and all the final slide data, which was based on 100%, and it doesn't look great, gets worse when you have 85% or 80%. So we need a mechanism that brings everybody to the party uh, to play the part in it, because it's it's the only way to do it. Paul also adds, do you see any funding opportunities in the programme for government and HP sector deal mentioned? I've not really seen anything of what the heat pump sector deal uh, will mean. Um, I've heard it banded around. Um, uh, fund, funding, yeah, you know, let, let's be clear about this. We've modelled it on the basis of um, essentially uh, public funding uh, at, at a cost of about 4%. Um, that is not going to pull in the private sector funding. The LHEs programme essentially is saying, let's make zones. So we followed that, that logic. I'll say a bit about Glasgow City Council as well, but we're going to have zones. Uh, what we are not at the moment able to do is to say, you know, particularly without the RHI, if the RHI was there, we'd have a different perspective. But without the RHI, the chances of getting uh, private money to come in and build this and take the risk at 4% IRR is fine of nothing. It's just not going to happen. So if the uh, plan is to get private money to build this, even if it's uh, spliced uh, public and private money is not going to happen. So um, we've got it. We've got to sort of um, be honest about that and say uh, if you want private money, you've got to you've got to make it attractive to them. Uh, and that that comes from uh, creating a justification for a higher price of heat, effectively, or a subsidised price of heat. Um, Glasgow City Council, uh, we shared what we were doing. They liked the direction of it. Um, it's not a, a Glasgow City Council paid for exercise or sponsored exercise, but we've we've kept in touch with the, the guys we know there um, just to say, look, this is what we're doing. Um, part of what we said was, we will go through a couple of iterations and feedback to you. This is our report. Um, you know, so we should we should almost be, be saying to them now, what, what do you think? Um, I think that covered those, those questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, there, there, there's a number of sort of points, I guess, just about the approach that we've taken. Tim Sutherland, you know, mentions, um, you know, maybe there is a value in, in not just sort of chucking, if you like, or putting some focus on the existing heat sources um, and getting data and using what they can tell us about how the, the, the grid could be used. Um, and he sort of puts forward the idea of, you know, using the existing heat sources as part of a transitioning process. Um, this would be a, a clustering approach, he says, where heat assets and dem demand nodes have a proximity principle. This should also help model cash flow and knowing the IRR. Knowing more about heat sources will always tell you where there is sur surplus heat generation. Um, there's also a, a number of people mentioned, you know, the scheme boundary and um, what percent of the stock is publicly owned. Um, so we've talked about the anchors. Um, we, we don't have a specific understanding of how much is publicly owned, do we? No? 
So this was not present in the uh, in the GIS data for sure. Um, yeah. Could be analyzed if we have more detailed information about yeah the origin of the buildings, but uh, that's something that we have no numbers on for the moment. I don't know, Dave, about you if you know the area more or less better than me, but uh, I'm a yeah. public account. I'll give, I'll give you my Ouija perspective. Uh, as a native Glaswegian, there's obviously the city council buildings, there's Strathclyde Uni, there's Caledonian Uni. Uh, there is one hospital at the top right hand corner. It's probably pretty low. I'd be really surprised if it totaled more than 20%. Uh, obviously, Scottish Enterprise Building, Scottish Government Buildings at the Bruma Law. Uh, there's a Ministry of Defence Building. Um, but it's broadly not. It's broadly commercial buildings. There's not There's not a huge amount of um, uh, uh, domestic. Um, you know, there's, there's um, not, not a colossal number of tower blocks, for example. Um, so it's privately owned domestic as well, which is really difficult. Uh, to, to hear the cats on that one. So anchor loads, yeah, absolutely need to do it, but I don't I don't see that uh being being enough of a a sort of a kickoff. It's it's gonna need more than that. Yeah. Um th there's there's a couple of points uh that, that come from um Kevin Bow and also Gareth Young about how it could be funded from I guess a more government heavy approach. Um Gareth cites uh, the work done by Lord Marshall. He decided that the capital cost of installing the electricity grid would be paid for by means of the standing charge. Every customer would pay a small amount every month, which would pay for the cost of construction and would reduce over time until it just paid for maintenance. Now the standing charge seemed to just go into private electricity suppliers' back pockets. Of course, it was a government-funded initiative because it was seen as a national imperative. Um, and Kevin, Kevin. Bo sort of echoes that thought saying, you know, is there a way that we can put some kind of yes charge into our gas bills to start funding these sorts of things as well? And um, well, there, there kind of is. If it's a commercial building, there's a climate change levy. At the moment, the climate change levy disappears into um, treasury uh, coffers. Um, I've certainly advocated in the past that if we're going to try and continue some sort of operational funding for the good stuff, why not use the operational levy for the bad stuff to fund that? So use the climate change levy direct to fund to fund the RHI. I think you know to be slightly more optimistic about this because uh, you know I, I sound pretty miserable at, at the best of times. 250 million uh, to generate a big chunk of um, this progress. B the air quality aspects. C the the jobs and all the rest of it over a 40 year period because these are long term life assets that we're talking about. It's only six million a year. So you know that's pretty small beer in the grand scheme of um, what we're trying to do to, to um, you know effectively run the country. So uh, those that say it can't be done uh, haven't found the business model, is my opinion. And, and if that business model is some form of central funding, just crack on and do it. I know it's not trendy in this country. It's it's maybe what uh, other countries would do, be it Denmark or anywhere else. But maybe we just need to to. Uh, you know, expect our leaders to put the put the shoulder to the wheel a wee bit and and make it happen. But at the moment, we've we've really um, you know we're we're kind of uh, at the end of end of the decade or the last decade where we saw pockets of district heating pop up. It was pseudo private. It was a university here or a hospital there or a or a new housing estate somewhere else. It tended to be driven by gas CHP which was trending upwards in its carbon footprint uh, as the grid decarbonized. So, you know, we're, we're at the start of the next decade. We've got to decide what it, what it is we want, how we're going to get there, what we're prepared to do to get there, and, and essentially um, bite the bullet. You know, we've ignored heat for as long as I've been involved in this segment, which is going on 13 years now. We've got to, got to grasp on nettle, uh, would be the, be the Scottish vernacular for it, and just work out how to do it and do it. It's not going to happen by itself. It's not going to happen with uh, public funding, uh, sorry, private funding. It's, it's, it's going to need some strong government. Okay, thanks, Dave. So um, there's, a, there's lots, lots, of, lots of questions coming through. Um, to sort of look at the financial um, aspect of it. Um, so one question we have, just a few sort of uh, yeah, questions. What we have from Mark Van Neusten, thanks very much for, um, uh, getting in touch. Uh, why is there no differentiation applied for the price of small and big diameter pipes? 
is one question. Yus Ansu, thanks also for getting in touch, asks, um, does the 4% IRR include indexation? Um, and I mean, there's there's a lot of other points. Uh, and then the energy efficiency piece, you know, how much how much money are we spending on energy efficiency to try and reduce the kilowatt hours? And the energy management piece, uh, Chris Davis asks, you know, have you considered sensitivity impact reducing the operating temperatures of the buildings and the networks? How does each uh, five degrees of temperature reduction impact on the IRR and cost per kilowatt hour of heat? What's the break-even network temperature, Chris asks? Thanks, Chris, good to hear from you. So there's there's the 4% IRR, um, there's um, the, the cost of the diameter of the pipe work, and then there's the piece of energy efficiency within the building and also the energy efficiency of the network itself, and how that can be built into our modeling or to what extent have we considered it? Um, I don't know um, if, uh, Kurt, you wanna answer some of, the, some of those or? Yeah, um, so concerning the, the cost uh, of the pipes per meter, indeed that's a good point, um, but after talking to uh, Vital Energy, yeah, we came to the conclusion that uh, most of the cost really go into the trench work and the installation work, and there was, in this case, um, yeah, not a reason to make a big differentiation between the smaller pipes and the big pipe, because the roadworks are, are too impacting and, and have a high cost. So that's why we took a, a flat fee um, for the, the cost per meter pipe in this case. We started originally with uh, a variation, so a cheaper price for the lower diameter and a higher price for the bigger diameter, but we decided to change that. Could still be revised in the future if we have, uh, let's yeah, say, more accurate information. But this is now how we came to this. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll pick up on uh, Chris's question about the the COP. Uh, he's absolutely right. Every every five degrees will lower the uh, sorry increase the the, the COP by about seven and a half percent, which is the single largest cost. Of this network is the electricity uh, to, to operate it um, going forwards. Um, that's that's why uh, the mini beams uh, input to this is is so critical. You know that's essentially what they do is they they take average networks and make them operate better. Um, it's every every single degree is a prisoner. Every time I visit Draman and I've been going there now for ten years, they really excitedly tell me that they've got the temperature down by one more degree because they've been managing their customers better they've been they've been paying uh problem customers to upgrade and paying half the cost for them so that they can you know, put better heat exchangers in better secondary side stuff so it absolutely every 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 degree is a prisoner um you know realistically we've modeled it on roughly 80 degrees uh i doubt that we would get much in an existing city like this i doubt we'll get much below 65 70 so i think there is a limit to how far we can go Clearly, there are um, schemes being advocated. The ambient networks um, is a, it's a huge sort of branch topic for the whole piece of exercise. It's clearly also uh, somebody must be asking a question about what about cooling. You know, that's clearly a a, a, a piece that's not not factored in the thinking too much at the moment. But uh, we can only drive the network cost, uh, the network uh, temperature down so far before we reach a a, a natural barrier in an existing. Uh, set up like this without going to a completely different architecture of dispersed uh, heat pumps and and uh, what might, some might call uh, ambient um, guys at Eon would call it the ecto grid. Um, it, it's not something that um, you know. I think you can uh, take into this and just say let's just do it. It's it's about the detail of it. I think um, the reality of that is uh, some sort of ambient network that. The diameter of the the width of the trench is probably likely to be bigger because you've got less delta on the network. We have assumed that we're going to get at least 30 kelvin on the network uh, and and try and keep the, the pipe sizing and trench sizing down. But um, it it doesn't it doesn't get the heat from A to B for free. That's the problem. Cutting cutting roads is the major major challenge in this piece. So there's two two points: cutting roads and ensuring offtake of heat. They're the two single biggest challenges in this piece, and the rest. Yeah, the challenges, but the, the, the pale into insignificance compared to those two. On 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 the efficiency point, if I may, Ben, um, it, it is a it's, it's a bit a bit of a challenge really because even the gas meter data itself isn't doesn't really actually help because 
you know, most of those buildings are probably running at you know 50%, 60%, 40% efficiencies, um, especially the commercial buildings, but but also probably the residential buildings itself. So, um, you know, you've got um, it's a chicken and egg scenario. Do you do you fit a heat meter on onto the building so you can see the real heat consumption rather than the rather than the gas consumption? Um, and when do you do the optimization? I mean, ideally, you do the optimization first. So you can see um you know what the actual true heat requirement is i think we all in the industry know that you know buildings boiler, boilers are, boiler plant is often oversized for various reasons and 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 that systems are very inefficient so that that does need dealing with um i think the point about the cost of heat versus gas you know you have got to bake into the fact that when you're supplying heat it is basically 100% efficiency on the heat meter going into the building. So you're quite right to be charging more than double the price of gas because the gas system probably won't be more than 50% efficient uh, behind the meter. Um, also, on the costing side of things, you've got, you know, I, I think it's very reasonable to charge a connection fee when the when the when the building isn't going to have to um, isn't going to have to um, you know pay for the maintenance and you know. And supply of gas boiler and equipment so often you know when we're looking at residential schemes and you look at the the heat trust calculator um com comparator for gas to heat network often those costs you can you can heat can be sold at a much higher price um and with higher standing charges than gas for, you know for those reasons and still be cheaper than the true cost of gas next one thanks ben um so there's, there's a sort of seam of questions that are coming through about, um, you know, there's the, it's, you know, have have we modelled, have we taken into account energy efficiency improvements to existing buildings, um, but also a lot about how can we integrate other um, types of of renewable energy, um, solar PV on rooftops, um, you know, demand side response, um, you know, how can we grab other types of energy to build this in. How do, I mean, how does the model, how does Comsoft deal with that? Um, and what, what, what is our point of view in terms of grabbing and, and integrating with other types of, of uh, energy source? Well, um, when we look at the capabilities of the software, we, we are currently migrating towards more and more capabilities for fourth and fifth generation types of networks. Of course, it's an evolution. Um, but yeah, all feedback, all uh, inputs are welcome. We take it into account for our new developments and, and uh, we can put it on the run-up for sure. Um, currently, we're working on um, methodologies to include uh, uh, combined heating and cooling uh, with different types of pipe configurations, uh, working on solutions with uh, multiple sources, um, working with um, profiles of uh, consumers, profiles of, uh, of supply of load. So that would mean that uh, when you have a, a solar roof panel, you know that uh, the heat supply will only be there during a uh, yeah, part of the day when the sun shines and that that part of the heat has to be um, yeah, taken out of the equation during nighttime. Um, so all these things can be taken into account. And let's say it's on our roadmap to evolve to a fully um, capable of planning fourth and fifth generation types of network, but that is going gradually, step by step. Yeah. Um, connection fees. There's a, there's a number of questions regarding connection fees. Um, we were asked, uh, you know, how did we come up with the connection fee cost? Um, and you know, another point made by Kevin Bow is is you have to you have to wait until the end of life gas boilers are, are you know till the gas boilers come to end of life before you can ask for that. What is the role of the connection fee? Does it have a big role? Um, you know, and and how is it attributed? Is it a successful way of of, of funding this? And and you know, what can what can we do with that? David, take that one or. Yeah, I, I, I dug into this a little bit. Um, I don't think it really features in the model at the moment. It was mentioned on the slide, but to put it in context, uh, 5,000 euro connection fee and uh, 1,300 buildings or something, it was only about 7 million pounds. It, it was somewhat irrelevant in the 250 million, uh, was my view of it. Um, would, would somebody operating the system have a connection fee? Yeah, they absolutely would. Would that vary uh, depending on the size of the building? Yes, it would. Uh, is that five thousand pounds per domestic customer? No, it's not. It's you know that would be a, a, a per building. You know there aren't very many individual family dwellings in the centre, so it tends to be blocks of flats. Um, 
would that have to taking uh, I think the chap James Kevin's comment about um, gas boilers? That's a really that's a really key observation. If we're going to do this at the pace at which gas boilers are are dropping and falling over, the uptake of heat from this will be really really much slower than if we said let's go at it. And essentially, it's all about business model. You know, some somebody's got a brand new boiler, they're going to feel a bit funny about it. But I, I would I would bet somebody a pint if they were into the the boiler room of the Hilton Hotel, who I always pick on because everyone knows where it is. You would find the boilers were really pretty old, and they still would not want to get rid of them because they've got them. This is the thing. So they are probably knackered. They're probably really inefficient. To to Finian's point, uh, they probably will still last another 10 years or a bit of you know continued maintenance and all the rest of it. Should we allow that building to keep using them? Absolutely not. You know, we're, we're sitting in a climate crisis. If we go at it in first gear slowly, we'll get absolutely nowhere. We need to come up with a model that says, do the right thing, whatever it is, and I'm not saying it's necessarily this model, but do the right thing and do it as fast as possible. Because it's only by doing it as fast as possible that you make, you make the thing have any chance of stacking up. The Hilton Hotel spending another, I don't know what a gas bill will be per year, but it'll be it'll be thousands, spending thousands and th probably tens of thousands um, for another 15 years. Uh, it's quite clearly just money that could have gone into the into the right solution rather than continuing to do the, the wrong solution. So we've got to come up with something that good plan and go at it and go at it hard. Yeah, um great. So yeah, I mean there's still lots of other other points coming through um so i'll take a couple of points that sort of that have there beside each other um so paul paul postin says great that you have taken this upon yourselves to create this level of ambition to assess viability of a large-scale strategic approach to decarbonization traditional economics are clearly challenging so how does society shift opinion to a new paradigm that allows the project to recognize the health benefits climate impacts job creation um, and 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 also Tim makes another point, you know, and that related to this is how do you overcome the consumer perspective of utility switching, particularly with the private sector? You'll need long-term contracts for offtake, a big challenge. Uh, plan room and commercial. Um, so that you know, there's a whole piece on you know how do you get the behaviour change, the perception. Um, now, I mean, how have we dealt with that? What do, what is your points of view, I guess, uh, with respect to the the, the 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 perception of heat networks within within the, the greater community. What examples are, uh, you know, do we have any examples out there that are a success in terms of getting people to, to think about things differently? I mean, I mean, obviously, when, when people move into new heat networks, they, they typically don't have an issue, I don't think. Um, you, a large part of East London, the Olympic Village, et cetera, you know, if you, if you buy a flat there or you put a commercial building in there, the whole that whole area, however many square miles it is, it is all district heating. And I don't think um, anyone has a particular issue with that. It's just about, you know, it's just about how you how we get these uh you know existing city centers which are running on gas next moved on to heat networks i think the the consumer um perception of it i mean you know it, it's still heat at the end of the day isn't it it's it's, it's something that can be managed i th i think there's two two bits of answer to that and, and one is government and one is all about uh you know the promotion of it it is an increasingly recognized fact that NOx emissions are contributing to more than just uh, lung conditions. And obviously the whole COVID-19 piece has been tragic in many, many ways, but I don't think society went into it with the, with the highest um, uh, sort of level of cleanliness or health of lungs. We've probably gone into it somewhat sick already. Um, I think as you then sort of uh, continue to read broader and broader topics on this and you start reading uh, uh, analysis that suggests that NOx emissions in cities contribute to Alzheimer's. You start getting really quite worried about it, but it needs to be more than just oddball geeks like me that are reading these sort of things. I think somebody needs to stand up and say, um, air quality in cities is killing us. It absolutely is killing us. That's why we're starting to do stuff around about transport. But stop talking about transport and start talking about air quality. The two are not the same. Uh, get, get to the point where we are talking about it. The second point, I think is really interesting is how much does it cost the government to spend 100 million deploying 
national assets that will be used for 40 years and create lots of jobs and improve the health of the, of the citizens. Um, is it? Do they get any benefit for the 100 million? Absolutely. How much is it? I don't know. Maybe, maybe someone like Paul Mosley, who, who uh, you know, he's one of one of the guys I've listened to a lot over the years. But um, maybe maybe he can say if a government spends 100 million, you get back in taxation because immediately you've got 20% fat. You then got the the income tax of all the the guys. So going back to the district heating thing and the cost of it, and let's just say it's 2,000 pounds a meter. Notionally, about 75% of that will be the cost of opening the trench and filling it. That's all labour. That's all. That's all salaries for the guy driving the GCB. So, and then he pays tax on that and national insurance and all the rest of it. So, a government spending 100 million definitely get a large chunk of that back, and that really starts making the the economics a interesting and b it probably takes you to the the, the conclusion that trying to fund this privately doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, some some big multinational. Uh, putting their money into this isn't going to get any any benefit back in the healthcare of it. So, you know, the only people that that do get something back is society. So society has to fund it. Society basically is a proxy for government. Is, is my opinion. But I'm I'm as as ever opinionated but not stubborn. If somebody's got a better understanding of it, tell me. Okay, listen. I'm going to pick up on a, on a few um few other sort of themes. Um, sort of 15 minutes left before we uh, we said we would uh, let everyone crack on. Um, now, certainly there's a there's a number of points um, Gerald's Gerald's put forward amongst other people about ambient loops and cooling. Now we, we are we talk it's called Heat Vision 2030. It's all about heat networks. What I mean, what is what have we discussed with respect to cooling, with respect to the idea that cooling is going to become only ever more important as climate change, uh, you know, change come, comes along? Um, how do we deal with that? How does the model deal with that? For this city, it hasn't, is the short answer. Um, it's Glasgow. Anybody that's been here knows that it doesn't get that warm terribly often. Um, gets above 15 degrees C, we all take our tops off, you know, taps off Glasgow. So. Um, you know, in other uh, locations, I'm a massive fan of heating and cooling. You know, the, the chocolate factory that we did is heating and cooling combined. We want to do the same in, in other industries. So he's absolutely right that it is, it is a, a solid theme. Um, that said, uh, are there air conditioning systems in the centre of Glasgow? Yes, there are, but they, they, they ought to run uh, less uh, than they do, but they are likely to run more than they do. Um, if we could find a way of uh, putting in parallel some sort of um, heating and cooling uh, solution, I think that would be a good thing. I don't think you turn the 250 million into 50 million by doing that. You probably make it uh, more expensive. Um, you probably make it um, harder for the consumer. You know, let's let's go back to the Hilton Hotel and what we're saying to them. We're saying to them uh, notionally. This is all fictitious, of course. We're saying to them. If we take away your gas boilers and give you a plate heat exchanger and give you heat, would you even consider that? And that is one level of complexity for them to get their heads around. If the if the offer to them is, how do you fancy having a heat pump in your building that probably uses working fluids that are being phased out? So that's a, that's another challenge. Uh, probably uh, needs an electrical supply that's larger than than uh, what they might have because everybody's got a fairly chunky gas pipe and a fairly small electrical cable unless they're a data center. Um, so there are there are very practical barriers to uh, something that is clearly very, very obvious. I've, I've said many times before, heating and cooling are opposite sides of the same penny. Problem is you've got to have them in balance, otherwise you've got a one-sided penny for most of the year. And that's what Glasgow principally has. It's got a pretty big uh, heating demand. Uh, down in London, slightly different story. Brand new buildings, slightly different story as well. I think we need to be careful not to transport uh, learnings from schemes. For example, Finney mentioned, um, you know, the, the Olympic Park. The Olympic Park will have a, a far greater demand for cooling than it than uh, than uh, Centre Glasgow because it's uh, a warmer down there, and b the buildings are far better insulated, so they'll probably have a, a heating uh, excess. For large parts of the year, this this project is about fixing the centre of an existing city. So sensible point, but I, I, you know, and I'd love to know uh, the output of doing a detailed analysis of it. But we haven't done it, and I'm not sure how easy it is to actually do that because I, I don't think some of the 
the sort of input uh, pieces really sort of uh, track onto this particular example, as well as other sort of process type applications. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier as well, we are researching that topic. We are working together with university, uh, and that will be part of our software planning tool, let's say, in the coming months. So that is something we are working on. So if we have to do um, designs for combined heating and cooling, that should be possible in a few months from now. And as you said, Dave, there has to be indeed some kind of a balance. It cannot be that uh, you have 80% uh, of the time heating demand and only 20% of the time cooling demand. There needs to be kind of a balance, not 50-50, but at least uh, 60, 40, 70, 30. That's kind of the limit before it's um, economically not interesting anymore. Yeah. Um, totally good. Um, I'll bring, bring in a, a, a question um, from Andrew Ewell. Get your building heat network stroke low carbon heat ready. What is the panelists' views on how we can get the data on heat demand, support potential connections to improve their efficiency and achieve the needed delta T? Andrew says he sees this as something our public sector should be uh, doing by default. So how can we encourage every building to get ready for the, for the change that is coming? What can we, what, what do they need? I don't know, if, uh, Finn, do you want to kick off? Um, yeah, I would go back to the old CRC scheme, which is was the carbon reduction credit scheme, which which forced everybody with a half hourly meter to start reporting electric consumption. Uh, and then all those organizations were put into a league table of electric consumption and you had, you know, Sainsbury's and Asda and but all that. I don't really know what happened to the old CRC scheme, if it just got ditched by subsequent government or not. But I think it's a, a useful concept and I think we need uh, regulation around the report, reporting of energy consumption in commercial buildings, I think then we would start to see a huge amount of innovation in the space because as I said earlier, most most organizations themselves don't look at their own data, let alone anybody else. So, um, you know, it, it would, uh, you, know, uh, you know, as an example, that would then feed into this project and we could then be looking at that that data um, and, and, and drawing analysis from it. Um, how you then I think the first stage is to get the gas data first um, because it's 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 the bit of information that everyone's lacking, um, and you know w once you've got that, that you know then you probably want subsequent policy to uh, get people to you know, implement optimization and, and and efficiency savings. The the intention behind the, the the CRC scheme was was that kind of league table concept around getting organisations to demonstrate that they were performing well. Um, that is quite an advanced concept, even though it's probably about 10 years ago now that that was around. But if you could do something similar, that would be outstanding. Obviously, um, from from a regulatory and policy point of view, if you could get organisations to um, report their gas usage and then uh, maybe report it on a per square meter or, or some kind of metric that showed how efficient that gas usage was um, would, would be an outstanding way to try and incentivize people to, to reduce gas consumption and implement energy efficiency, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll do something on like that. Uh, it's, the, it's the second most sensible thing I've heard Andy Yule say over, over many years I've known him. Uh, the other was uh, fuel poverty is, is a poverty issue, not fuel issue. Uh, a great line. Not sure if it says it or he pinched it for someone else, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it to him. Um, the, the comment about the, the public sector buildings, it's absolute genius. You know, we don't need to wait till we've built a heat pump and built a heat network to start getting any building, and it could be any building, uh, heat network ready. Um, the obvious thing that springs from it is uh, slightly different, which is, in the centre of London, the, the GLA policy is to make buildings that are applying for planning permission either to connect to district heating, which is good, or uh, make their buildings standalone uh, islands of excellence that are they've got their own heat pumps and doing all their own stuff. That actually makes it harder to put district heating in because you've got a pipe running past the front door of that recently refurbished or built building, that, and it's not going to sell any heat for that 200 metre stretch. So actually making buildings standalone excellent islands is, is probably wrong policy. And it's exactly what Andy's saying. What they should be doing is making people build these new buildings that are heat network ready, which means connections and temperatures. But the bit I've taken away from this, and it's exactly why we do these things. It's QA and I, question and answer and ideas, or how to make it better. And his observation is, is absolutely brilliant. The government should be going out and making buildings inclined to be 
network ready because a they know they're going to have to do it it's a little bit like there will be no uh, need to drive a petrol or diesel car after 2032 whenever it is let's let's shout it loud you are not going to have to still be running a gas boiler after 2030 in the center of glasgow why can't somebody say that um you know it's a massive it's a massive challenge but if you're going to do that start getting your building ready and if it's the city chambers let's pick on them for a change um they should be getting their systems uh, heat network ready. And that basically means not higher flow temperature than 75, if not significantly better, and as wide a delta as possible, and get the pipes down to the pavement level. You know, do it now. All the buildings, you could do all of that bit first, and then the, the heat network second. You know, if yeah. it's about creating jobs now, let's, let's, uh, let's have a, a look at that. Okay, listen, guys. We're, we're heading into the, the sort of last few minutes. Just, just to pick up. Um, there's a lot of suggestions coming through about, you know, and this is, I think, where Comsoft, you know, and, and and this is what the the point of the project as well is. There's lots of suggestions about how the how the the design of the system could look, um, how you could tweak, you know, where you're putting the the heat pumps or how you're 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 connecting things up and how you're using DSR or whatever it happens to be. So. Those are all brilliant. Thanks very much to everyone for your suggestions. I'll pass them on, and you know, and, and, and if we can have a, a discussion offline, that would be great. Um, there's a lot of sort of points about what are the next steps. How do we, how do we engage with, in this case, you know, the local government, the broader government. Um, you know, it's, you know, how can we borrow from from other types of, you know, good good example of law and legislation and regulation. I mean, this is, I mean, that's kind of our next step, isn't it? It's, um, it's. It's how we how we get these other power brokers around the table and, and making decisions. A question for the for the for the audience. I'm not sure who's who's still there, but anybody that's involved in city management or or government, how are you going to drive uh, uh, offtake surety or, or uptake of heat network connections? It's it's the single biggest number in this model of how what percentage of the buildings said yes. And how are you going to get from zero to 100? What what legislation are you going to use? What policy are you going to implement? You know, that's not something that we we're we're a, we're a bunch of technical guys. But how how what's the the social sciences aspect of how do you make people join district heating? Because if you don't make them join it, yeah, the net present value that looks absolutely stinking at the moment just gets worse. So the the burden on society gets worse because effectively we're making less people pay for. The same solution. How, how, how do the, you know, there's uh, so the delegate list. There's, there's guys from Dublin involved, and um, there's there's plenty from the continent. You know, who's doing what in terms of driving uptake? Yeah, listen, and just just also just to sort of bundle together a bunch of responses regarding the issues and the logistics of putting pipework in the ground. Um, there's a big there's, clear, there's, a, there's a lot of people that have commented on the fact how that needs to be mandated. It needs to be done logistically and in conjunction and in collaboration. And it's certainly something that came out of, of our discussions as well, um, how complicated a job and how, you know, how a key part of that whole, this whole system is how do you get things in the ground in a way that is actually affordable and what a missed opportunity is not to include other utilities. Um, any final comments, guys? I mean, there's loads more questions, but I think we'll have to deal with them um further down the line any other um any other points you guys want to finish off on jolly and good well listen only, oh, yeah. only only to say if there's if there's folk that think that they have got the appetite for putting in some some free graph to make uh you know this even even better i don't think we'll model it all over again you know we've kind of we've kind of done that but but get in amongst the, how do you actually deliver this plan? That's what I'd like to see uh, Heat Vision 2030. We, we know technically roughly what it looks like, but how, how are we actually going to, you know, what are the policy gaps, what are the drivers, how do we make that happen? Because at the moment, it's just it's just a fictitious idea. It's not it's not sanctioned by anybody. It's not got any basis in, uh, yeah, this is going to start happening next Tuesday. You know, it's... it's um, yeah, I say, Dave, that um, we, need, uh, we need a little... Um, we need a sugar daddy like Aberdeen City Council announced they had today, right? BP, BP is going to be funding their uh, low carbon future. Um, righty ho, well, that, that, that indeed, 
we would love to hear from you. Please, everyone who wants to discuss more, get in touch. My details are coming up. Just let you all know that we'll be putting together a webinar as part of the Advancing Heat Network series in a few weeks' time, three, four weeks' time, that's going to go on a much smaller scale. It's going to be looking at the heat interface unit within the, the home and dwelling. So a very, very different um, discussion, but one related to how 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 looking at the dwelling scale um, heat management can really reduce risk related to community heat networks. Um, if you want to get in touch and, and and talk more about Heat Vision 2030, please do. I'll I'll collate all these questions and points you're you're putting to us and uh, share it with the rest of the team. Um, but for the meantime, I think that's us. And uh, thanks very much for for attending. Thank you all. Cheers. Yes, bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys.